Welcome back to the RTS Podcast. I'm Mike Tushir, and this week we are talking with two other RTS coaches, Jim Ellie and John Garfano. And the topic for our conversation is all about unorthodox training responses. We've all had athletes who've responded really well to training interventions that run counter to the conventional wisdom and responded very poorly to the normal, typical powerlifting training interventions. We wanted to spend some time talking about that, uh, spend some time talking about uh, these lifters and what is required of the coach to make a better decision, a more reliable decision, and hopefully get a, a better athlete response. So um, we're obviously talking a lot about emerging strategies just because that's kind of our dominant um, training paradigm. It's the way that we think about training. Uh, if you're not familiar with that, uh, you might be lost. Uh, so I would definitely check out the emerging strategies presentation on YouTube. Uh, we've got a, a free seminar, basically. It's a one hour long presentation. Uh, it's on the podcast as well. Um, but we've covered emerging strategies basics a bunch. This is more for people that already get it, for people that are already maybe even using it. Um, hopefully it gives you some ideas on different ways that you can be creative, different ways that you can interact with the athletes and different ideas to try. Uh, always, as we say in the podcast, follow that trail of athlete response and that's enough preamble for me. Uh, here we go. I'll take you right into the conversation. So one of the things I think is really awesome about the emerging strategies framework and just the idea of bottom-up programming is that it gives you a lot of it puts it puts a, real, a lot of responsibility on the coach for being creative and coming up with ideas and and really making it work for the lifter, and I think that can be really scary if you're starting out coaching, but obviously working, you know, on staff and with everybody at RTS, we have a pretty good framework for the rules and for how we should be handling certain situations and giving kind of guidelines in those situations, but. For me, and obviously for you guys, there's been situations where even the, the guidelines don't seem to make sense based on the actual athlete response. Like, the thing that the athlete is responding to is just way out of what we would expect. And so one of the things that I was hoping to share from, I just got back from the European Championships in Lithuania, in Konis, and uh, it, it was one of the... It was a really good moment for me as a coach because I think it becomes much more fun to work with athletes and actively engage with the process of finding out what works for them. And sometimes part of that process is failing and and or just not meeting expectations. And that can be kind of hard for me, I mean, for me and also the lifter because you put all of this energy and effort into trying to make something work and sometimes it doesn't and then if it doesn't work well on game day it can can really hurt it's like man we got to go back to the drawing board we got to really start thinking about it and it's awesome when it actually happens and so uh one of my lifters that i had at the european championships uh ben wharton uh, we've been working together for like a year now and had a few competitions together and last worlds uh we, we kind of under we, we did well i mean we placed well we did well in terms of the context but not in terms of expectations and we really went back to the drawing board and just decided to look at every single variable that might contribute to prog progress and what we found was he was responding really well to high rep work and i know mike has had a lot of lifters where they respond well to high rep work and nothing else and as they you know, crank up the intensity, they tend to fizzle out. Um, and this is something that isn't necessarily a truth with Ben, but what we did know is that he did respond well to high rep work. So we had to figure out a way to get him to peak 
and actually carry over that high rep strength into uh, high intensities. You know, how do you how do you, how do you turn a six at an eight into a single at a ten and make that single at a ten a all time PR? Um, so I just want to start there. Like, have you got how, how John and, and Mike? How often do you find yourself running in the situations where you have to like optimize the peak in a way that doesn't seem to line up with most peaking approaches and most like periodized approaches to peaking. I think if you look closely enough at it, there are most, uh, most often deviations from kind of the textbook pattern, you know, that, uh, I don't know too many people that just respond so averagely that the kind of textbook pattern is the optimal pattern you know there's always seems like always some tweaks that that can be made that help you know and some people need more tweaks than others you know and yeah i I think the operating rule is following the trail of athlete response you have to follow the athlete response wherever it goes even if it leads you in the direction of something that you don't personally believe in, you know, that the athlete response is, is the thing that, that should be driving you forward. You know, that if you're, if you do something that you don't have a rationale for and it works, then that's still important information about just how to operate in the world. I mean, of course, try to figure it out, figure out what works, but, or why it works rather. Uh, but the fact that you're establishing a link between a training intervention and the athlete response is the most important thing. And I think that I, I was, it's, it's funny. This is timely, I think, because I was just talking with someone today about, uh, about this phenomenon, actually, they're a classroom student. And they were kind of frustrated that, um, you know, they'd been through the class and they were sitting down to write a program and they felt like they still didn't know why, they they still didn't know which rep range to pick. They still didn't know whether to do load drop or repeat. You know, they still didn't know these things. But after talking to them, they realized that there's not a rationale. I mean, I can, we can come up with a rationale. Uh, to help you decide between six reps or five reps, you know, but it's going to be contrived and it's going to be wrong plenty of times. You know, the top down rationale is idea fuel and that's it. You know, after that, you, you just have to, at some point have the guts to try it and follow the trail of athlete response after that. Yeah. I think that's the, that's why I was saying at the beginning, like it's kind of scary because if if the top down approach is just ideal idea fuel, um, that's that's helpful if you only follow a top down model. Like if everything's top down, then you just kind of have some safety in that it's not you that was wrong; it was the the model that you chose. Whereas with the bottom up, it's like you implement it. You had the complete power and control of the creative decisions that are happening with this individual. And if it doesn't go well, it's like, man, I, I did that. I messed up. At least it can feel like that a lot more than um, at least how it used to feel when everyone was just following like the, the DUP and well, this is how you do it. And if the athlete doesn't respond, it's their fault. Whereas now it's like, no, it's it's a collaborative effort in finding that connection between input and response. And with Ben, one of the things that we did and uh I find to be it was most rewarding is that we had this idea uh, that high rep work was what he responded well to, but how do we convert it into a high uh, a single? And the only real way to find out was to run a block that was, you know, kind of a greatest hits block. And then since we still didn't know how to taper effectively, we had to get creative with a taper. And that's kind of like the second level. Uh, second order kind of optimization is okay we can run a block that works well we can run a block where the estimated one or max improves 
But how do we correlate that to improvement in, in one or, when actual one rep max? So with the taper, we had we decided to do a mock meet. And we were going to do the mock meet before the British so we could get a bit more confidence before just saying, okay, well, you respond well to high rep work and, you know, we'll figure out a taper approach and whatever. Because the taper matters a lot. Like, if you mess up the taper um, in terms of the last week of training, not necessarily like the taper, but what is the last week of training going to look like before the comp? Um, And whether they need a, a traditional taper or not, was kind of the thing we were looking for. And with, with Ben, I didn't seem to make any sense because a traditional taper involves, you know, openers and, and warm ups and like higher intensity and lower volume. He's super volume sensitive. So what we did was just kind of a flipped week where we just had him do the supplemental exercises on a Monday or on a, the assistance movements on a Monday and then the supplement movements on a Wednesday. And then he took a two day, two days of rest and then did the competition lifts on a Saturday. And like, yeah, he was literally doing deficit deadlifts for nines on Monday and then high bar squats for eights on uh, like Wednesday and like full volume, you know? And I know we talk about that in emerging strategies, but I'm personally still pretty re- like shocked when it works. Uh, and like in his case, we did this mock meet and it was like this all time PR for his one or maxes, like, I mean, I didn't know what the numbers were going to be, but everything was up by like 45 kilos in like less than five weeks. Cause we actually optimized that first order, like the development block. And then the second order was like the taper week. So it, yeah, you're realizing a lot of gains that had been, had been there, but unrealized, I guess up to that point yeah exactly because everything was showing progress but then once we got to like game day we couldn't put it together and Mm -hmm. that gave us a lot of confidence for the british um he had you know the british we still made progress on the british but the whole block was a bit uh a bit difficult because some sickness happened and like you can't really peak properly if you're getting sick you know for nine days before the competition um, but then, you know, we're like, okay, we trust this. We're going to lead the, we're going to lead with the information that we have for the Europeans. And, you know, assuming you already got, you're not going to get sick this time. Everything's going to go pretty well. He's got all the energy. He's got all the focus and motivation and drive. Now let's just put it together. And, uh, in this situation we did put it together. It went really well. Uh, all time meet PR. He ended up literally getting all the goals that he planned for, for, for euros where we got third, um, third place in a, I think he was nominated sixth. So we moved up three spots and just put the right weight on the bar each, each, each attempt. And like other people missed. And so we built the total and got third. And like, for me, it was so rewarding to see him, um, just so excited and so happy. And like, it seemed like that feeling was mutual. And I just thought that was kind of a cool story to share with ES, especially for if coaches are like wondering about their doubt, doubting themselves and like wondering if, you know, do RTS coaches ever doubt them themselves? <laughs> it's like, yeah, but the key is that if it, for me, it's like if something does happen, I'm writing it down. I'm, I'm, why did it fail? Why did it mess up? And what do we have to make sure we don't repeat? Um, and Ben, Ben plays a huge part in that too. You know, good, good athletes tend to be quite, aware of of like what they respond well to and what they prefer because i find it a little bit more difficult if there's no preference at all and it's just coach do whatever you want well you know jim i got a question for you so you took some very unconventional strategies to say the least to help then peak for um for the meet what was the process like in getting athlete buy-in because you know having someone do deficit deadlifts for nines on a Monday, you know, leading into their meet, I can imagine psychologically um, could be challenging, or maybe not. So I'm curious what the uh, interaction was like between the two of you and how you sold that. Yeah, well, I think the it was really easy to get athlete buy-in once we followed like what should work, and then it didn't work. You know, what should work is that we, you know, we we graduate from high reps, high volume, uh, down to lower intensities and you know lower volumes as we get closer to a competition, and then we do the normal. Uh, taper and peak well every time we tried to do that it wasn't working so it's like 
okay, Ben, you know, clearly you and I know that this isn't working anymore and we're going to have to get creative. Like that's the answer. We're just going to have to get outside the box. And here's an approach that like, here's a tapering approach that I've been implementing with other people and it's worked, it's worked pretty well. I know it's not traditional. Um, and he was like, well, if it works, it works. Like he, he, all he wanted to do was succeed. So the com the fact that we talked about it uh, and talked about like this is my idea this is what I've noticed to work well in athletes in the past um, in search in in situations like this I think helped him feel a lot more confident. But the other thing was he we made sure to test the ideas and and we exp like we talked about it like this is an experiment we're running this block into like a mock meet to see if this is an approach that works for you. Because after, I think after Worlds, one of the things he expressed to me was we need to figure out the tapering approach, like specifically. And I thought, yeah, like it does matter a lot what the taper, and I say taper, I, I mean the week before the meet. Like, what does that look like for him? And I wasn't thinking, I don't think I was as critical over that week as I am now. Like now I, I'm starting to realize like, even though it's not, it doesn't need to be a taper, it does need to be an approach. Like the meet week has to be something that's proven to elicit a good performance on game day because you can't just depend on the, de the dev block for, for everything to just work out like regardless of that, that last week. So, you know, I just said, look, this is what we're going to do. It's going to be an experiment. We're going to try this flipped week for the, uh, for the meet week. I'm going to keep the volume pretty much normal and then we're going to rest two days as we would like for a normal a normal taper but uh we're not going to do openers we're not going to do singles we're just going to trust that you know every single week that we did the dev block you did squats and you did you did deadlifts and bench press and you know how to do it all we have to do now is just do it for one rep on game day um so he's like yeah man we'll do that and it worked on that on that mock meet so after it worked on the mock meet there's no more well, I don't know. It's like, yeah, that's what works. We'll just do that. <laughs> I'd like to clarify something that, that uh, you mentioned. Um, when you say that you can't depend on the dev block to bring it together at the end, uh, can can you just add a little bit more to that? Like, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is, Let's say, you know, you're, you're for this circumstance, the dev block is implying that, uh, so for his dev, that dev block, we're not touching any repetitions under, under five. Literally, there's no exercise in the program with reps under five. Um, and that will show a positive response in terms of his estimated one rep max improving. But our goal, obviously, is to improve the actual one rep max and to be able to realize that one rep max on on the platform the last week before the the meet um some athletes still need some modification there because uh like if they're flying or they're taking a train or they're like traveling to the competition they might not have four days to train so they might need that extra day to mentally prepare whereas if you just ran right through you know you could have three days of training and then the competition would be like that saturday um so that last week just needs to be dialed in you can't just depend on every like running everything as normal i mean you might be able to but it just needs to kind of match with the athlete preference in terms of like what do they need to prepare for on meet week and what are their constraints and what are they used to so they can actually perform singles um yeah so it's like that that meet week needs to prepare them for the competition it doesn't necessarily matter if the development block is pushing their estimated one or max up still. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think I see where you're going with it. I mean, it's, and I want to touch on the flipped week thing again, uh, but it sounds to me like it's mostly about this specific case. I mean, it's not that it's a rare case where you need to do a traditional taper, and I know that uh, a lot of the coaches on the on the team have gotten really fond of this uh, flipped week concept, uh, especially in that last training week. Um, but um, I, I think that it's also fairly uncommon 
are, are fairly common. I mean, to have someone run through a, a development block at the end, you know, and just keep that last training week fairly normal, um, take off two or three days and compete, you know, as long as the exposure is timed up correctly, I've, I've had that work as often as, as not for sure, you know, um, but about the, the flipped week, um, do you want to lay that out? Cause I think it was, I'm not sure who started doing that, but I think I heard about it first from Isabella. Um, but that's something that I think both of you guys probably have a lot more experience with than I do at this point. So, uh, does, do one of you guys want to explain kind of what the flipped week is and, and what the intent is behind it? So Jim, the, the flipped week, if, my, if I understand correctly, if you had four training sessions in a week, let's just say, and your assistance and supplemental movements were really focused on that third and fourth session, um, normally, the week leading into the meet, what you would do, would you would, swi- you would switch those so that the competition exposure happens on the day of the meet. So they still do their assistance and their supplemental movements, typically on the beginning part of the week, but they're skipping their competition movements until the meet day. Is that right? Yeah, and so because so usually we what would happen is if they like you said if there's a four day template that we're using or four day structure I should say, where yeah, accomplice are on Monday, assistance lifts are you know scattered throughout the week as well as the sub lifts. We kind of pick the most important ones, the 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 most like preferential ones, so the athlete really likes them, and we put those at the beginning. So it'll turn into like a three day week where two of those days are like training days and then the last day would be the competition day so typically we take one day away from the the total training just because again most people tend to need to travel uh and then if they have like a weight cut they got to do that extra training session probably isn't gonna well for the people i've worked with it didn't hasn't seemed like we need to maintain all four training sessions we can cut one that acts as like a little bit of like a, a like a real taper in that we reduce some of that fatigue and get them really mentally prepared and physically prepared for game day. And then, yeah, the assistance lifts usually come first on day one, usually four to five days out. And then the supplement li- supplemental lifts are on like three days out, and then we rest until competition. And the intent behind this is to manage the number of exposures uh, so if you're peaking consistently on exposure number six, then you want to place the sixth exposure of the competition exercise on the competition day. So uh, that's kind of the the technique for doing that. Uh, I was kind of, I mean, honestly, I was a little skeptical at first, but then we saw it, you know, work pretty consistently. So. Again, I mean, you're following athlete response. It doesn't matter what you think of it. You know, if it works, then it works. Well, the the thing that's funny is that I remember Isabella when we were doing our seminars. Um, we were, I was like, hey, Isabella's like, hey, so what happens? You know, if you have a lifter that peaks in five weeks and like they have their competition, like, do you do the minus one approach where you do, uh, you know, that fourth week you have the comp lifts on Monday, and then. So the fourth exposure would be the fourth week, um, and then everything's pretty much normal Monday and Tuesday, uh, maybe one, Monday, Wednesday, and then that fifth exposure is on the competition. And I was telling her, well, I don't like that because I'd rather get as much of the the practice. It, it, that's not true. I don't not like it. I just have said I just told her that the other way to do it that I've I've personally liked doing for myself and then for my my lifters is. Yeah, just flip it on its side on week five so that you're not, um, you don't have to cut the weeks down. You could just, oh, you peak in six weeks. Well, that sixth week that well, we need the competition exposure, we're just shifting it from Monday to Saturday. And to me, that made sense in my head. It's like, well, why not try it? And then obviously it's evolved until to where like almost all the coaches I've used it at least, at least a few times. I don't know. Have you got, you've used it, John, right? Or no? Yeah, I've, I've used it. I would say my default approach is probably a time to peak minus one. You know, I think that's probably where I default. Um, however, if an athlete is doing really well from a fatigue standpoint, 
Because what I'm always thinking of the week of the meet is, you know, fatigue and fitness and making sure that we're balancing that out in some way so that fitness is continuing to improve while fatigue is being managed. And if an athlete really needs a reduction in the competition lift um, from a fatigue standpoint, then using a flipped week makes a lot of sense because inherently um, assistance exercises and supplemental movements might actually be less stressful but could actually continue to improve fitness. So that actually may help them. Um, so I've had a couple situations where that works out well. Um, however, I would prefer to do a uh, time to peak minus one kind of as a default. And if that doesn't work, then try the flip tweak. Um, you know, another thing that I've run into is challenges where you have someone like, let's say with a five, to, uh, five week time to peak, so five competition exposures. And I recently had an athlete who he had a meet and then he had three weeks to peak again for his next meet, except he peaks in five exposures, which, you know, conventional wisdom would say, well, that would be impossible to do, right? You would have to sort of maintain a peak. Well, I didn't maintain a peak. What I did was I, uh, excuse me, it was actually four weeks. Um, so he had a pivot week and then he had three weeks to actually um, uh, to peak in time for the meet. So what we did was we used a, a micro cycle um, of one week and then the next week was two micro cycles so basically two competition exposures that following week and then a competition exposure on the third week so that's four and then the fifth one happened on the day of the meet and he actually improved his total by i want to say it was uh, 15 kilos from the meet that he had just done which is really challenging to do going from you know a meet four weeks ago and he was actually saying, should we just try to maintain the peak? And I'm less, uh, like, I'm really reluctant to do that because I feel like maintaining a peak is much harder than peaking again. And if an athlete has some additional capacity and they can do a 2x microcycle frequency, why not? Have you guys ever run into something like that where you've had to, like, shorten a peak and, and make it happen? Any time that I've been in that situation, I've been able to manipulate the frequency a bit so maybe just running a straight 2x frequency or something like that or maybe you choose to compete not fully peaked you know but um, I mean that's kind of the other standard response I would say is it, it is kind of it was well, definitely getting outside of the conventional approaches to kind of mix frequencies inside of a development block. However, like it, you know, if you kind of went back to some of the more, well, some of the more throwing centric programs uh, from Bonnerchuk and, and whatnot, um, the way that they would plan something like that would be to count how many exposures you need to peak and then uh, work backwards from the competition uh, and, you know, custom, basically custom stretch shrink the microcycle so that it fits. You know, the, the trouble that we've got is honestly just our, our marriage to the seven day week, you know, yeah. it, and it's just a, a practical consideration for almost everybody that training needs to happen on certain days. And, it can't happen on other days, uh, but you know, imagine for a minute that that's not an issue for you. Then maybe you do have a four-day microcycle or a, uh, something like that, and that gets you timed up correctly. You know, so that would be kind of another way of doing it, and and maybe more of a, a purist way of doing it. But for almost everybody, that's going to run into scheduling problems in a pretty serious way. Right. Because I can imagine one of the challenges might be if something comes up in the athlete's life and uh, training has to get pushed off, that could totally throw off the weekend. Yeah. 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 And I mean, that's kind of the other drawback to, well, it, 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 it's not just a drawback to emerging strategies as a drawback to any training system, but it's just super obvious in emerging strategies that things go better if you've got stability. You know, if you have a consistent sleep schedule, consistent nutrition, consistent time uh, time of day to train, thing like that, things like that go a long way to helping 
create a reliable response. And that's true in any system. Uh, it's just really obvious in this one. That's what I like about Absolutely. the bottom up approach of like in coaching, because it, it, when those variables, like if those variables aren't obvious, then it can be easy to look at something like, oh, well, the, 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 the rep range that you used was the problem because it's not so clear that the five hours of sleep you're getting a night are impacting your, you know, your normal performance because what's a normal performance if every other week is different, you know, who knows? Right. Exactly. If there's too much noise in the system. Yeah. And it's, I know we talk about that a lot and it probably sounds like we're patting ourselves on the back for using it, but it's like, there's no other way to feel and my, like I've never felt more capable of handling problems like that than yeah like at this point I think I feel the most capable of making sure to like follow that process of what could be the 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 impacting the confounding variable like what is affecting what matters is it the fact that you're like not focusing at all when you're in the gym a lot of times I I'll talk with my lifters and and they'll they'll like you can kind of see in their videos that they're just kind of I don't know they're not intentionally like half-assing it you know it's not like there's anything wrong it's just that you can see the focus is kind of blunted um and a lot of times I'll bring it up and it's like hey man you know like there wasn't a lot of energy in that lift and they're like what do you mean I'm like well, you like just for kind of going through the motions and then they're like, well, I guess I usually do that. And then I'm like, oh, okay. So what we need to work on is like intention. You know, we need to work on that focus in, in the gym and minimize all of the, like maybe we have too many fluff exercises. So like a lot of times I'll, I'll, I'll prevent myself from adding extra work for an athlete at, at the start. It'll kind of be a more of a minimalistic approach kind of for a similar reason because then like I can make sure that they have enough energy mentally to just focus on the training that matters. Because if you have, let's say, uh, seven sets of squats in a session or something, and 70% of those are like you're not focusing because you're thinking about the other seven exercises that you have, and you're just like, God, can't wait to get done with these squats. I just feel like that can definitely impact the quality of response. And I think ES allows for that. Yeah connection to be made i mean that's not that's a sentiment that gets echoed uh in some of franz bosch's work uh, about dynamic systems theory and uh, skill acquisition technical perfection things like that too that intention matters you know and, and if if you think of I mean, it's funny how things go through phases, and, and the longer I'm in this, the more phases I identify. But uh, for a while there, it got really commonplace for to hear people say strength is a skill. And people at that time were really treating it like a skill, like comp lifts only all the time kind of thing. And uh, I mean, we could talk about why that's not the best approach, even if strength is a skill, but you know, that's a different conversation. But I do think that it's an, it's a really valuable idea to think of strength as a skill. It's a, it's an expression of a skill and it's not a big part of it is a voluntary skill, a, a conscious skill, but there's a big part of it. That's a subconscious skill as well. And I think um, having intention when you train is one of these critical variables that we pay almost no attention to in a coaching theory standpoint because we can't quantify it. I can count how much volume you've done, I can count how much weight you've lifted, but I can't measure the degree of intention or the amount of focus that you're bringing to a session. And I'm convinced that that matters in a really big way. You know, it's interesting you say that, Mike, because um, one of the things that just came up during a call I had with an athlete, um, he was telling me that as he stood up with the weight for a squat, he felt like he could be really braced and very... Um, 
dialed in. But as soon as he started to walk out with the weight and get ready to squat, he, he lost the focus of bracing. And so he felt like he would have his chest fall pattern just simply because he wasn't focused. And so kind of focusing on that, like what, where was your mind? Like what were you looking at in the gym? Were you looking at other people? Like what, what were you focused on? Um, and what changed from just standing up with the weight on your back and then walking out with it and then going to execute? So to your point, um, we don't typically measure that in any type of training system, the intention behind the lift. And it's so important. Um, kind of going back to something that um, that Jim had just said, that you know those are variables that can impact the peak, that the quality of the movement can impact how high that peak is or how much exposure they're getting or how much stress they're getting. You know, um, If somebody doesn't focus on their deadlift and they round and they're not used to rounding on a deadlift, what does that do to the quality of the movement and the potential increase from week three to four? John, uh, I, th- that may remind me of our conversation since you're coaching me now um <laughs> it, it, we we have been deadlifting on uh saturdays and like that really shouldn't be a problem uh but for whatever reason it seems like my friday nights i am either a little bit more social on those nights so i'm staying up a little bit later because i mean you know, i'm hanging out with friends and it's like i don't want to go to bed at 10 on a friday <laughs> um <laughs> and and then I still train in the morning and so and like I got my dog and like basically every other thing still requires me to wake up early so what that means is I'm not getting as much sleep on on Friday as I am on um like my my Sunday night to my my or my Monday night to my Tuesday training session where I have squats and bench so one of the things that I know we've been working on is like well like potentially it was a stimulus like potentially singles aren't the thing like for my deadlift maybe I just don't respond well to them but in my mind, like, I doubt that's the problem. I, th- I think I, like, every time I go to the session on Saturday, I'm tired, like really tired. Like I can't believe I finish it. Um, and it's like, I, I mean, maybe you can talk about your experience with it, but like from my perspective as like an athlete in that situation, it, it would be unfair for me to then think like, John, like what? We got to we got to do something else next block because the singles clearly aren't it, and it's like I have to be I have to reflect on the things that I know to work for me individually and anecdotally um, to then give you the information that I think you can use to to optimize the next block without jumping to conclusions. Sure. I, so I think the big piece is asking a lot of questions. You know, you and I have a really good relationship, and you happen to be a coach, so that helps. You're knowledgeable. Um, but, you know, you could easily take any lifter that's been around for a while or is a high-level lifter and you're in the same boat, right? An educated lifter. And I think um, if you have someone who's self-aware, you can ask a lot of questions. Um, and if you don't, there's a lot of experimentation that needs to happen. So kind of fast forward, what we're attempting to do now is put your squat and your deadlift on the same day. Minimize the amount of stress in that session. Use that session as a benchmark to look at all the rest of the work that we're doing throughout the rest of the week to help drive the improvements in your estimated 1RM. So that's from a, from a stress balance perspective, that's a change we made. But also it's, it's, it's a template change. Like it's the same old reason why so many people wanted to do their comp squat on a Friday night versus doing it on Monday. Like our default programs at RTS, we, we have a tendency to put a lot of comp work early in the week. Not, you know, that, that's kind of like our default. But um, that being said, there are some athletes that you know, they get in with a group of people, it's Friday night, they get energized and if you're that type of lifter then you could have an actual increased um, um, exposure in that kind of environment Um, so that could increase your rate of gain on the development block so part of it is you know asking good questions and it's more than just the hey how did your training go this week it's you know getting into the environment getting into athlete response getting into their intentions and then trying to explore a couple of options and measure you know one of the things that we're doing is we're not changing a whole lot in this block you and i and we're going to measure progress and see, did moving, just moving the deadlift from Saturday to Tuesday, that make a change for you? Yeah, and like, I think what you said too about asking a little bit more um, and t- talking about environment, uh, I have a few lifters, it's like, okay, well, I could squat, you know, I could do my comp lifts on Monday, but like Tuesday's way better because all my friends, like you said, like all, all of their friends are there and they seem to get a lot more focused and they have more fun. And 
Like that matters, especially when you're th- talking about whether or not you're going to add five kilos to the bar or not. Like, yeah, maybe you could hit your yeah. what they say in a squat every day, like your minimum effective, like your minimum max. Is that what it is? Like your minimum squat or whatever. Like you can hit that on any day, but like, why would we make the squat session not? If we can have, if we know that every Tuesday all your friends are there and you can make that a consistent thing, like. And you notice that you sp- respond well. I f- I feel like that's going to add up over time than like having a session where you're kind of tired or just not as excited. And I mean, there's another point there because maybe the skill acquisition for that lifter is we need them to be able to perform at any time, any place without any stimulus. But that's that's like one of those second level things is when do we want to implement that? When do we want the lifter to, to learn that? And when are they comfortable to start saying, okay, I don't want to rely on that. One of the things that Mike said in, uh, in the video, I think we posted a few weeks ago on a YouTube video is like, don't create, like make sure that the rituals that you create are like, aren't dependent on too many variables. Mike, I might be misquoting you, but it's something like that. Yeah, you don't want to you don't want to create rituals that are not repeatable or rituals that you depend on that you don't have control over. Yeah. Um you know, the it's kind of a, a famous trope at this point that you know, somebody has lucky socks and it's really they really believe in their lucky socks and then someone throws out the lucky socks and then you know, then they're uh, a wreck until they figure out that, you know, it was, the, the luck was inside me all along, <laughs> right? Like it's it's a Disney movie or something, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I mean, so you just kind of want to be careful about what types of rituals you're creating. Um, you know, if you, the hype thing, though, I think is, not unreasonable most of the time. If you go to a competition, you're going to have external energy present at the competition. So if that's your thing, you like to train with it, and and you can do that consistently, then I normally don't have too much of a problem with it. It's it's when it gets to the level where it's not sustainable, that's a problem. Uh, Or if it's kind of intermittent, or if the athlete just doesn't like it, like for me, I don't, I don't like a lot of it. You know, there's there's like a happy medium, you know, and that's where I train. Uh, and then when I go to the competition, it's too much usually, you yeah. know. So, so I'm like trying to calm down at, at competitions. But I mean, there's a lot of people that fall into that boat. Some people just are more stimulus sensitive uh, than like external stimuli sensitive than other people, you know, they, some people really like that, that environment and other people don't. Um, that brings to mind, um, an athlete that I was working with Mike, where, um, I went to her meet and I said, so, you know, for game day coaching, what do you want me to do? Do you want me to try to hype you up? Do you want me to try to calm you down? What is it that you need from me today? I like to always ask that question as a coach. And she said, listen, you know, don't worry, I'll get myself hyped up. You know, I, I don't, I don't need that. In fact, I need you to calm me down, you know, and all of my hype up is going to be internal. You're not going to see it. And I don't want you to make me into something I'm not. And it was great because that was fantastic feedback. So literally finish an attempt, come off, ask question. Hey, you know, what were your observations? How do you think it went? Then we can make in our, you know, our, our next attempt selection and just, you know, casual, just move on about our, our day versus another lifter where it's, you know, you're hyping them up and, you see a lot of people getting smacked on the back or whatever it is. Some people need that. Um, but I think it's important to not separate, you know, the physiology from the psychology and just understanding that people have different preferences in the way that they train, the way that they compete, um, and all that stuff matters, you know. And that's why I think emerging strategies is great because that's one variable that we're not changing, right? It's like it's it's one piece that we're keeping the same throughout a development block. We're not changing all of these different strategies. And we're helping to try to keep something the same so that the no, there's not so much noise in the system, you know. Versus, hey, let's change volume every single week, or let's change intensity or rep ranges, and that that can get really messy because is it the actual change in the program or is it something? Else? Yeah, I think some sometimes it can be difficult to like. I think it's a philosophical 
buy-in type of thing with emerging strategies because you have to really understand that that's the point is that we're trying to figure out the the truth not just did it work Mm -hmm. but it worked for you for this reason consistently relatively speaking we can track it and do it again because so many of those variables were were controlled for but you know there are other camps might feel like well that's no fun like you're just doing the same thing every week that's kind of a rip off but it's like what what we're doing is learning it's like a it's a process for learning about a person not i mean i don't even know like a top-down approach is a very strict top-down periodized approach is like we're just trying to get someone to improve but i mean and sure you can apply learning like you can learn about the athlete and learn about what works if you're using a a strict top-down approach but to have the freedom and the flexibility and also it demands that the coach takes so much responsibility over the decisions that that you know we're making it's it's not as easy of a buy-in philosophically because it puts so much of that responsibility on on the coach but then also it requires that the athlete is very communicative and and is is engaging in the process as well um Otherwise, you know, you can just look at the data, but as we just talked about, if you just look at the website and just look at the block reviews, there might be pretty key information that we're not getting from there. And so if the athlete isn't like speaking with us about, uh, you know, how they're feeling, but like more in depth and, and if they're not making those connections to like a lack of sleep, then it's our responsibility to try to get that conversation to happen. So then, you know, they're realizing more about their life and more about what they prefer and what they respond well to. I think you can see a lot of elements of a bottom up approach. And now that I've learned more about kind of what the essence of a bottom up approach is, um, we use a bottom up approach in emerging strategies. And I see them, I see bottom up tendencies, uh, I see parallels in the way some other coaches plan training where they have some, uh, there is variance probably more than we would do in a development block, uh, but there's less variance than what we would have written prior to emerging strategies. Um, It reduces the noise a bit, allows for a little bit more signal clarity so that that learning can happen. I think the problem though, and not the problem with those approaches necessarily, but um, just kind of a top-down approach in general, is that it pulls a lot of the creative power away from, from the coach. Like you just don't have the freedom to follow the athlete response wherever it goes. If you subscribe to, um, you know, kind of a a block, let's say block periodization approach or, or any sort of, you know, linear periodization approach, there is a certain pattern that needs to take place with the volume and the intensity in order to peak. And if you don't do that, then you're not adhering to that model. Uh, in that case, you're limited in the creative solutions that are available to you. Now, is that a big deal? Well, probably not a huge deal for most people, right? Most lifters respond pretty well to that approach, which is why it's become kind of the de facto default approach. If, If every lifter responded like trash to that, no one would do it, right? So it's got to be all right for most people. But the question then is, is it the best? And is, are there any tweaks that you can make to it that would make it work a little bit better? And, Oh, what if you're, you happen to be one of these people that, you know, just responds the opposite way around, you know, like, you know, we've talked about a couple incidences at this point that where 
things went unexpectedly or athletes responded in kind of an unorthodox way. That's all the time, <laughs> you know, like high level lifters, low level lifters, experienced lifters, not like just everyone has some sort of unorthodox response. And the thing to me is, is generating a reliable way of, of figuring out what those unorthodox responses are and taking advantage of it in a, in a planning sense. And I don't think that you can get there. Like, like, like the, the reverse periodized ones are the, probably the most salient, uh, examples in this case, you know, um, like I've talked about, uh, working with, uh, Brett Gibbs for the 2018 worlds, uh, and how we basically reverse periodized his deadlift training so that he started like the second to last block was like this middle intensity range. I believe it was like 85%. In the last block, uh, most of the work was done at like 70% because that's what, um, that's what the data was showing was his best response. And we were just following that, you know, and, you know, like you said, Jim, I was really nervous about doing that because you are taking it on your shoulders, you know, and you're going to do this unorthodox thing. And if it blows up, Hey, you're, you, you made the call, you know, and, um, we did it and it worked. Um, and we're really, really happy about that. Um, but I, I think about that. Would we have ever gotten there if we had been, you know, adhering to a block periodized, uh, approach or a linear periodized top down planning system, even if we were following the, the practices of kind of reducing variation to better parse out the signal versus the noise. Would you, would you, is it possible to ever get to some of these really unorthodox solutions, you know, and that's kind of where I come down on a lot of it theoretically, you know, but I, I think a lot of that now, sorry, sorry, John, I'm rambling on here. Um, I think a lot of that, I think about it now, there are solutions out there that just seem unlikely to work to me. You can still plug them in to an ES framework. Um, and I think at that point, the question that pops into my, my head is, are you a good enough coach to follow the athlete response wherever it goes, even if it goes to something that you kind of <laughs> don't think is going to work, but you know, all signs point to that being a, a valid option, you know, can you, can you go there? So back in 2013, I was working with a gal and, um, I had just put her through a volume block and right at the end of it did, did just the gym test and was astounded by the results in like a four week volume block. And I just, I couldn't believe the results. And then we went into, you know, a strength focus block and then a peaking block. And by the time she rolled into her meet, she, had, she, she was actually doing worse than what she did when she was doing the volume block, but I had stuck to this model. And I kept to this thought in my head. I said, you know, what if I just did that volume block all the way through to the meet? Like, what if I had just done that, you know? And it was a learning opportunity for me. So after taking emerging strategies, I, you know, I said to myself, I'm, I'm gonna learn from that experience. And when I see an athlete response, I'm going to follow it. Um, so that was the first thing I wanted to say, Mike, because I kind of connected to what you said. And then the second thing was, you're talking about unconventional, you know, um, training and unconventional program writing. So I had a conversation with an athlete just today, and he was talking about how he had always done his assistance exercises right after his competition lift. Well, it just so happens that that's been like my current obsession right now is writing these programs that have that theme in there. And, you know, prior to emerging strategies, I might not have done this because I would have thought to myself, well, there's just not enough frequency. You need to, you know, squat more than once a week. Like that's not enough. I've had astounding results with athletes that respond to it. Not everybody does, but those who do, they love it. So, you know, I, I don't know. I think to your point, you know, it's for us at RTS, it's the three tenets of leadership, relationship, and creativity. And I feel like from a, from a coaching standpoint, I have to be creative enough to 
solve a problem, that creative problem solving. And I have to have a relationship with the athlete to, to dive into more than just estimated 1RM. Like there has to be more to the conversation. And that leadership piece is to feel comfortable going, this is what we're going to do. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. But all signs point to this is probably the best decision to make. Yeah. I, I, I mean, that's a really, really important piece of the ES framework. I mean, if you're going to take responsibility and you don't have the leadership, or you don't have creativity, you don't have a relationship, then like you're almost signing up for a bad time. <laughs> you know, like how are you going to how are you going to take responsibility and then not have all those? But um, the other thing is that you kind of have to be aware of your biases because, you know, when you are taking all that on and, and you are working with individuals like and you have an idea in your head it's like well i'm creative right now but it's it's like well what if you have seven blocks to write that week you know like you got to really say well i know this isn't what i mean you know maybe you have seven people you're going into an exploration block and i think a lot of times if we have an exploration block then hey maybe three people are going to try this like different idea that i have because they're all bought in and they talk about it and you're excited about it and a lot of times that excitement can get more than one person to to want to join the, the the new wave that you're riding but uh that's kind of the thing that is easy to forget is that we are all biased as as humans and that not, might not be a, a bad thing it's just that we have to be aware of it so that when you know like mike said if the athlete response is indicate like if the thing that's allowing for a positive athlete response is just continuously unconventional and you're like this doesn't make any sense. Why is this? Why is this working? Like you just got to keep going because that's really the the right thing to do for them. And it, that's when it does work. Like when Mike's situation with Brett, like it's the most rewarding thing. I, I it, competitions are for me as a, as a coach much more than did they do well, but more like what did that feeling mean to them what did doing well mean to them what did it take for them to experience success and i think that this struggle of finding the solution and then actually experiencing that success with them collectively is is what makes this system worth it in the end because obviously we can just find a thing that works and stick with it and never change it and just, you know, it's unlikely. There's some lifters that's gonna happen, obviously. But it's very unlikely that's consistent over the long run. And, you know, maybe you pick up someone that is just a pretty good responder to most things. But even then, at least when you do put something together, it it still feels like it's something you built than something you copied. And I find that to be cathartic, I think, is uh, how I describe it myself i was gonna say maybe this is a great place to conclude you know i think there's a lot of really cool stuff that we talked about today and i think you know the big piece is is being willing to as a coach understand your bias and then understand that there's a lot of different strategies out there and we're solving we're not solving the problem of what would most people respond to we're solving the problem of what does this athlete athlete you know a b or c respond to individually and if we start to see a response moving in a different direction, are we willing to put aside our biases and, and explore that a bit?